So the University of West England have invited Tony Hayward, former CEO of BP, current chairman of Glencore, the world's largest mining company, to give a lecture on the future of energy. Now this is a man who's been plagued by scandal. He presided over BP during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill disaster, and he's chairman of Glencore, a company that was recently named in the Paradise Papers for associations with corrupt businessmen in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and a company that has been accused of allowing child labor within its mines and causing natural disasters throughout the world. Now, is this a man who is best placed to be serving as a role model in informing staff and students within our local university? We've managed to get an interview with him, and we're gonna be putting some tough questions to him to try and get some answers. We're joined today by Tony Hayward, former CEO of BP, non-executive director of Tata Steel, and current chairman of Glencore, the world's largest mining and commodity trading company. So Tony, first the uh, BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill disaster, then the market crash of uh, Gino Energy, of which you were chairman and co-founder. Now Glencore and the Paradise Papers, there's been a whole load of scandals which you and the organisations that you've been involved with um, have, uh, have been affected by or uh, caused in some way or another. So from your experience, what... What lessons do you think students can learn from your lecture tonight um, for those who are interested in the sector and the future of, of energy? Well, my lecture tonight is on uh, the, what some people refer to as the great energy revolution, the progressive decarbonisation of the energy that we use and the challenges associated with that. Um, I hope people are going to you know, understand, you know, not... not in the UK, but the challenges globally that uh, come with um, what the world has, in, has embarked on trying to do. So, I mean, yeah, Glenn, you've, you've kind of been on both sides of the fence, as it were, in terms of fossil fuels with BP, and then also with uh, uh, ex extracting various precious metals through Glencore, um, copper, cobalt, mm. and other things that are used for, uh, for batteries, for uh, you know, electric cars, and so on. And we often think of the transition to renewable energies as a kind of a progressive uh, force for uh, for the direction of general direction of uh, kind of travel. Um, but how progressive do you think it is then for uh, kind of local people in the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo? Do you think it's uh, benefiting yeah, them? I think um, if you you've probably never been to the Democratic Republic of Congo, no, I've uh, been there quite a few times. Yeah. Um, what the what the mining industry has done on the ground is pretty extraordinary in providing jobs, livelihoods, well-being, social programs, schooling, education, um, malarial programs, a whole raft of things that have, in that area, in the area around where they operate, lifted very many people out of poverty. So whilst there are lots of challenges with uh, the impacts of mining in the community, a lot of people benefit very significantly, no doubt about that. And, and the challenge is that we can't, we can't be the government, we can be the mining company. But some would say that perhaps uh, Glencore or companies that it has been associated with have undermined uh, the government in Congo through uh, transactions that have been revealed in the Paradise Papers. I mean, the, the, the operation in Katanga Mine, uh, according to campaigners, has cost the uh, DRC hundreds of millions of dollars. So whilst I appreciate there are uh, beneficial programs for local people, I, I, surely I, I, the... Uh, I don't want to get into a sure. big debate about okay. the Paradise no, Papers, OK? There is a, there is a, a very um, well-documented basis for the uh, various transactions that occurred. What, what is undoubtedly true is that Glencore's paid a lot of taxes and royalties to the DRC over the years, and it has made a very significant impact positively in, on the communities in and around its operations. So, I mean, in hindsight, do you think that the, uh, the, the, the loan that has now become uh, apparent through the Paradise Papers to Dan Gep, uh, the uh, uh, businessman who was previously accused of corruption, asking if Glencore asking him to negotiate mining rights in the DRC. Do you think that was a mistake? Should the uh, kind of due diligence department, the compliance department of Glencore, avoided um, 
that in the, in the first instance? Is, was that was a shareholder in the company. That we were a shareholder, a minority shareholder in the company. Of. And it was a commercial loan to allow him to participate in a capital raise in the company. The money stayed in the company. It didn't go to Dan Gert, it didn't go to anyone else. It was a capital raise in the company. We, gave him a, we, we made him a commercial loan that allowed him to participate in a capital raise. Yeah. That was it. But he, he is a man who has been widely accused of corrupt well, activities in the DRC. It sh- it, it, it sh- there, wouldn't there have been quite a lot of flags raised um, that should have alerted uh, departments at Glencore to well, avoid doing business with it, an individual of this type? The, the first thing is, hindsight is a wonderful thing. This was back in 2007, 2008, before many of the red flags that you're talking about today. But he had a reputation in that region from that, I assume that's why Glencore went to him, right? Well, he, was, he was the man who knew people on the ground. He, he, and he, he certainly was. Yeah. And, and the due diligence that was conducted showed no evidence that he was doing anything that was untoward. So why the uh, secretive offshore company to, make, to facilitate such a transaction? It wasn't a secretive offshore company. Well, it, it was a it, it was a listed company on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Well, the, the transaction was uh, scantily referred to on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Well, but yeah. anyhow, um, at the Glencore AGM earlier this year, uh, you told a shareholder that Glencore had conducted extensive and thorough due diligence procedures in regard to this business relations with uh, Dan Gertler. Um, what were those procedures? Oh, they, without going into details, look, first thing is, yeah. this was in 2007, sure. a long time before the company became a public company, a long time before I was involved in it. Yeah. But the company conducted due diligence with respect to Dan Gertler, yeah. in terms of his dealings in Africa, both with respect to his, you know, was he an appropriate person to, to deal with? And, you know, at the time it was deemed he was. I think we have been uh, very clear that this is, none of this is new. None of this is new news. And I'm not certain there's any pressure building on the company. It's not new news, okay? This is retreading old ground. As you said, I was asked by a shareholder at the annual general meeting. I've been asked at several annual general meetings. Uh, and, uh, as you may or may not be aware, we ch- took a decision about 18 months ago to several links with Dan Gertler. Um, I think we have answered the case, frankly. You don't think that by, by hiring someone closer to Congolese president, pumping him with cash, and mandating him as Glencore's well, man in negotiations... I think that's all, all assertions. You think okay? you, you, that's Can all assertions? That, that, there's no evidence that anything that we had with Gertler yeah and, and there's no none of them we know for a fact that mm. that loan stayed in the company okay we know for a fact we have a paper trial to prove it okay. and we demonstrated it yeah and that's been okay. released that's been published it's been published it's been demonstrated to the relevant people yeah so um yeah, it, would there, is there anything else that you'd like to add on the topic of tonight, drawing on your experience? Well, look, you haven't asked me anything about the topic of tonight, right. actually. Yeah, so I'm asking you... You've asked me a lot yeah. of questions sure. about a current news item, sure. which isn't what we'd agreed to talk about. We'd agreed to talk about my speech tonight, which well, was about the energy transition. Sure. So but you're clearly not interested in that, so at this point I think we'll just forget it, shall we? That the fact that Glencore had achieved... Uh, direct control over a mine in Congo in order to facilitate this transition to renewable energies is uh, intricately linked to the information that's come out in Paradise Papers, is it not? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting angle on the lecture this evening. One which you wouldn't want to explore? No, I look, I've explored it, okay? Yeah. You've had a go at exploring it, I've responded. It's, you know, I don't think there's anything right. more to say on the Paradise Papers. We have a response on our website, we have a response to the various journalists who've asked us the questions. I've not given you some answers this evening. Is there, I mean, do you, do you see yourself staying at Glencore? Is that certainly? Yeah, you're not considering a, a job in crisis management? Well, I'd be quite, well, you know, I have some experience of it. And frankly, uh, most people who've been in industry for 20 or 30 years have got experience in crisis management. It's the sort of thing that happens to big companies. Yeah, quite some, on quite some scale for yourself.